All right, uh, let's go ahead and introduce everyone. Um, so today we have all three of the co-authors of Observability Engineering. Um, hi, I'm Liz, I'm a principal developer advocate, George. Hi, uh, I'm George, uh, head of ecosystem and partnerships uh, here at Honeycomb, it's Martin. Hi, I'm Martin Thwaites and I'm a developer advocate working with Liz and the rest of the team. And um, Charity is off answering her doorbell, um, but Charity is our lovely and wonderful CTO. And um, we joke that she was the uh, first dev role at Honeycomb. Um, it just wasn't officially her job title. Uh, anyways, uh, so we spent the past uh, three years writing uh, this, this book called Observability Engineering. And um, it finally went to press in May. And we are doing this recap series. Boop. We're doing this recap series to kind of cover some of the um, points that we may not have gotten to address in the book um, to kind of give people a walkthrough of, you know, book club style, like let's let's talk through um, some of the interesting facets of the material and to have an opportunity for you all to ask us questions about the uh, material in the book. So to oh. kind of go ahead, George. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I was just going to sort of start a recap because I know that we've covered a lot of ground in the series and we're about like halfway through uh, all of the chapters of the book. So um, I will, we won't recap everything that we've covered, um, but if you if there's anything that you've missed, I very highly recommend going back and checking out any of the, the previous episodes. Um, but I do wanna point out for everybody that's joining us for the first time that we intentionally started this series at chapter five, which is um, why structured events are the building blocks of observability. And we specifically started with a technical definition that is what makes everything else that we cover possible, right? So arbitrarily wide structured events are the basis of everything that we cover in the book, right? And I think where that really came together was, was our last episode, which was the core analysis loop, uh, tuning a data store for uh, an observability workload, and then uh, considering whether you should build or buy. Um, and so, right, like, yes, you must have data of a certain type, Right? And in the, the, that first opening session, we showed how logs are structured data. Tracing is just an, a series of interconnected logs and metrics can be calculated by, by summing up or, or aggregating all events over a particular uh, time span. Um, and so often that's referred to as the three pillars of observability, right? But those are just the data types that you need. And that is only one very small part of the picture. Uh, the bigger part of the picture is how you analyze and use that data uh, to surface issues and understand whatever's happening in your application, right? No matter how novel or bizarre of a state it's gotten itself into. And so that brought us to last chapter, which was the core analysis loop, right? Which is a methodology for quickly isolating causal attributes inside any subset of queries or, or activity in your system. And that's, that's kind of a groundbreaking way of troubleshooting and in the last episode, we talked about how that's very similar or akin to the scientific method, right? You probe, you observe, you make a hypothesis, and then you collect data that, that validates or invalidates that hypothesis, right? And, and repeat. And, and that essentially is, is a core part of observability, right? And then we looked at from there, um, what are the functional requirements that you need uh, for data retrieval so that you can enable that kind of user experience, right? So how do you have to tune a data store in order to effectively retrieve data that helps you operate in those ways? Uh, and then finally, right, uh, knowing the outcomes that are required and, and how it should work, then, you know, we, we talk, should you build an observability tool or should you buy one? And what, what, are the, what are the considerations there? Right. And so Liz, sorry, I didn't, I didn't mean to interrupt, but I just wanted to highlight that like, I think the last session that we did was, was by far the best one uh, so far in the series, because for me, I think it's, it's the real technical requirements that are at the heart of observability, right? Because I often talk to folks and they have a hard time differentiating observability from monitoring, right? And, and we cover that earlier in the webinar series, but I think in the last episode, we drew some really clear lines right? Like, does your data analysis experience look like this? Like, if yes, that's observability, right? If no, you're probably doing something else and, it, and it's probably very close to monitoring. Um, so I highly recommend um, watching at least that last episode as well as any of the other ones that, uh, that, that you might have missed, 
right? And so I'll just cue, tee up today by saying, like so far in the series, we've looked at day zero concerns, right? Like definitions and concepts and requirements, like what do you need to know going in? And then we sort of shifted to day one type things, right? Like what is the user experience? How should it work? Like how should it be implemented? And I think today we start shifting into uh, more day two type things, right? So tips for getting started. How do you get observability going in your organization? And, and how do you get it going in your development workflow? So I don't know. Liz, did I miss anything or is there something you'd like to add? Nope, to that? that's, that's it. Uh, and awesome. Charty is back. So uh, Charty, hosting Sweet. duty is back to you. Excellent. My carpet people are here and getting started on the stairs. I'm getting rainbow stairs put in. It's a different color for every stair. I'm so excited. It's going to be amazing. Um, okay. Uh, yes. So slides. Um, so thanks for catching us up. Um, we want to start with, uh, we want to start with um, what is observability driven development? Um, and um, this is something that's very much, you know, um, I, I would say it's kind of, I feel like, you know, as George recently um, observed, like when it comes to SREs, like we're kind of in the um, early majority state, but when it comes to like developers, uh, it's still very much, you know, a thing that only cutting edge innovators are really doing when it comes to really writing their code with instrumentation and then observing it in production and, um, you know, having that very tight feedback loop of, you know, I just wrote it, I'm looking at it, I'm understanding it, instead of just sort of like waving our hands at the giant black box and, and seeing what comes out. Um, it's, uh, it, it's, it's, so it's a very, it's a very cutting edge topic. And this is something that changed a lot, even over the course of while we were writing the book itself, um, which is why I'm so excited that we have Martin here to show, to show us some stuff that is hot, so hot off the presses that it is like, it is still smoking and steaming. Like, I think you, you finished writing it yesterday, Martin. Uh, yes, yeah, there was a scramble this morning and yesterday around the engineering teams just to make sure that we were 100% right so we don't show you something that isn't actually coming. Um, but yes, it is that hot off the press. <laughs> But I think what's really interesting about this is, you know, historically, um, you know, throughout the entire uh, past past bit of these webinars and like, you know, in, in the broader history of the field, observability has historically been this like, you know, oh, you use it when stuff when uh, I can swear on the webinar, right? I, you know, <laughs> when when shit's on fire, right? Like that you need observability. But that is still kind of reactive. And I think that it's really neat to start thinking about shift, you know, shifting observability left, right? How do we bring observability in earlier? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think it, a lot of this comes down to as well, understanding systems. We talk about understanding our systems in production. Well, observability is still going to help you understand your systems when you're running locally as well. You know, we talk a lot about tracing, giving you causality and the amount of people who just use logs locally. When actually, if we can level up our production by moving from logs to tracing and showing that causality, why shouldn't we be doing that locally? Why shouldn't we give those superpowers that we're talking about SREs having, why don't we give those to developers and stick it in their core analysis loop? As it turns out, you know, as much as we do a lot of uh, murder mysteries in production, Unless you're writing your code correctly the very first time, your code inevitably has bugs in your development branch. It just does, right? <laughs> There's no avoiding that. So you actually spend far more time investigating murder mysteries, like, uh, and we consider it a part of local dev. And it shouldn't need to be that hard. Um, to what I find amazing is is the um, when we we talk to a lot of customers when they see the the first WTF moment um, in their production system, going, well, that thing shouldn't be going through that bit of code that's that's not how that thing works well if we can bring that into the development process that wtf moment doesn't happen in production it actually happens locally in your development environment which is a nicer place for it to happen than when you've got hundred thousand customers using it <laughs> well, i mean if there's any you know there's that famous piece of research that came out of facebook where they showed that the cost of finding and fixing bugs goes up exponentially from the moment that you type them, which means that the sooner you can find it after typing it, right, backspacing it is about as fast as you get, right? Finding it before it gets shipped to production is way better than having to find it 
after you get to production, even if that is still like way better than, you know, what most people are, are accustomed to having. Cause you can't, and, you can't, you can't even analyze the code in absence of the system. You know, they're part of the same thing. It's true. And, and you want to find it in local development as soon as possible. However, there are times when certain bugs only appear with this like weird permutation of factors that's only happening in production, right? Sometimes. And I think, yeah, <laughs> right, exactly, yeah, right, oftentimes. And I think to, to Martin's point, right, um, we tend to think of local development as sort of, you know, this, this isolated environment and there are tests that we run in a sterile setting, but in production, so many other things are happening right, that you can't possibly replicate in a local staging or local development environment. And so we're trying to bridge those concerns and trying to give you the same methodology in local development that you use to identify issues that is also the same methodology you can use in production to identify issues that couldn't possibly be replicated anywhere else, right? And that's, that's sort of what observability-driven development is. Or as Jessitron pointed out in the last episode, really what we're talking about is observability during development. Right, like mm. during the development phase, how do you start thinking about what you need to observe, like what data you need to collect and do it early on? To play devil's advocate for a second, right? Like I'm a software developer. I, I you know, what if I claim I have perfectly working observability from running, you know, you know, attaching attaching a debugger like Delve, right? That why is it that I need to think about changing my tool chain? Um, have you ever worked in multi-threading? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know that, that that to me is one of the the big things that um doing this sort of tracing based development so tracing during development tdd you might call it but i think that that might be taken by something else i don't know um but the doing that tracing during development if you've got an application that's um you're spinning up a ui it's making seven different api calls you attach a debugger which thread are you trying to debug here? Which which one of those is the, the one that you want that is that particular call? Sure, you can make an API call to that individual endpoint, but you've got seven or eight different requests there. And it's really hard to then step through that code. Mm. And if you and flip that, that around and say- printf debugging, and if you're doing printf debugging, you may, right, like then we'd lead down the path of, that we've talked about earlier of why tracing is just much more causal and better than logs. Exactly, exactly. And then if you're using that same thing, if you're able to debug this locally, if that's something that's important to you to understand about your code flows, about those parameters, if that's something that you care about locally when you're developing, why don't you care about it in production? So why are you using the debugger locally and something else for production? You've got a context switch that's happening between tooling. So it's this idea yeah. that we should use the same tools and also that use the right tool for the job and often the debuggers are not actually the right tool for the job anytime you can get away with using the same tool across multiple scenarios you're going to win because the cognitive overhead of switching tools and situations and learning multiple like tooling is so high right mm -hmm. so anytime that you can you can bring production closer to your development environment or bring development environment closer to production and and use the same like cognitive framework when dealing with them you're going to you're just going to you're going to have way more of your brain cells to actually dedicate to the code instead of the tooling around you that's what happened with kubernetes the, yeah you're not making the leap like the cognitive leap of trying to connect a bunch of dots and make correlations between those systems right part of why that that you know very scientific method of troubleshooting works is because you're looking at the same data. You're consistent about your hypotheses and what data you're using to analyze and, and validate or invalidate those hypotheses, right? So yeah, to Charity's point, anytime that you can sort of close the loop on those things, absolutely, right? That, that's, that's the right way to go. So I think that's kind of what inspired me to, to start thinking about how do I bring tracing a little bit closer to what I do day to day rather than just that. Let's wait until the end and let's we'll, we'll add some instrumentation just before we go live. It'll be fine. You know, what's what's has anybody had that problem before when you wait until we go to production, add your alerting, add your monitoring um, and it's all retrofitted in and it's never really feels like it's ingrained in what you're doing. And that's why I started to look at how could we start bringing open telemetry in a bit closer? How could we start giving tools to developers that mean that it's part of their analysis loop? So I think we, we've talked a little bit about, uh, you know, the reasons uh, why, uh, I, I guess, uh, uh, 
you know, why you shouldn't do it retroactively or like why we should use the same tools. But what does, can we maybe talk a little bit about what does the development experience look like when you decide to start using observability as part of that development loop early on? Like as I'm developing a feature, like what should I be doing and what should I be thinking about and how does that play out? So I, I think there's a there's a couple of different ways to look at it. And I, I look at it in the the idea of testing, um, which I'll come on to in a second, but the the idea of being able to write a piece of software and understand the flow of my that request through my code. That's important to me to understand while I'm developing that this method is called this method or this part of the database has been hit and it's hit this database call five times. Those things are really interesting for me to know while I'm actually developing my code. But what I need to be able to do is get from that to actually see that data really quickly. That's a really a key thing that you need to do, that, um, that REPL cycle of, I need to be able to see that thing right now. I can't wait 20 minutes. I can't wait five minutes for those things to be able to be seen. I'm used to that idea of hit play button. I mean, I'm a .NET developer. We love our big green play button. Um, so you hit the play button and you've got all of that data right there and then. So you've got to balance those two together. So you don't want something where you're waiting a minute for things to be processed. You know, they're going through some aggregation. They're going through all these things. You don't want that. You want as close to being able to see it in real time as possible. And that, I think, has been the big gap with trying to do tracing during development is how do we get to a point where developers can see right there and then where they are when they're developing to see that bit of information. And that's where some of these features that we're developing at the moment are coming from. Super interesting that we talk a lot in the kind of reactive use case of you cannot wait a minute to verify whether your fix worked, right, in production because, you know, your site is down or whatever, or degraded or whatever. But it turns out that there's also another super valuable moment when you're in a state of flow as a developer, right, like you don't want to get kicked out of that state of flow. And, you know, I, I have to go and get up and get a cup of coffee while I wait for the metrics to process is not good enough. No. Not at all. And that, you know, we we're talking about that context switch. This context switch is all the way along that chain. This context switch from being in my IDE to going into a completely separate tool. There's a context switch of how I look at this versus how I look at that. There is a context switch from um, I'm typing my code, I'm waiting for the pipeline to go, I'm waiting two days for my thing to be deployed, and I've done context switches in between before I get to production. There's a context switch of the tool that I use when I'm local versus the tool I use when I'm in production to know that these things have gone wrong. There's context switches everywhere throughout that development cycle. And how can we reduce that context switch? We can reduce it by um, a lot of the things where we talk about those Dora metrics, you know, trying to reduce the amount of time from when you write your code to when it actually gets onto production. All of those help reduce those context switches. Um, the whole product team methodologies, again, help context switch. But this is just one of those, is how do we make sure that the tooling or the, um, the what was it, the XKCD, the compiling, <laughs> maybe, you know, waiting for metrics is the new compiling. Um, <laughs> so how do we just reduce that? So freaking frustrating when you're like, okay, I've made a change. Wait, <laughs> wait. No wonder people want to fall back to logs because at least they will reliably, more or less reliably, like show up or right after they've executed. Um, but that's not, yeah, that shouldn't be the only thing. Martin, why don't you show us this, this exciting stuff that we've been waiting for? Awesome, awesome. Um, so cool. So the idea was, and this is .NET, um, as my Twitter handle would suggest, I am a .NET developer, um, and that's been my focus. Um, Obviously, we're going to be bringing these to all of the different um, the different distros that we do. Um, so um, let me share a screen. It should be that one there. Okay, so a prefix about this by I. I basically got a solution that Microsoft had built, which is it's basically got a little SQL-like database on it. Um, it's nothing particularly special. It's got a little bit of a UI um, in there. So if I was to take this and run it, we'll see a load of logs coming out. We're using Entity Framework. So there's a lot of things that we get um, by default um, on here. So basic website, I'm gonna zoom in a little bit. Apologies, I don't do CSS. That's why it all looks bad. Um, I'm a back-end developer, so um, sue me. Um, but we've got just a basic site where we can throw things in and we can add some more 
um, people in and we've got some people. Um, so if we look at this in a traditional way, what we've got here, we, yes, we could attach our debugger, um, but we've got all of these log entries coming out. There's a SQL command there. Um, there's some initialization of a framework, um, that kind of stuff. And yes, like you say, they appear immediately. They're right there and <laughs> they're right there in front of me, which is really awesome. Um, but what I'm missing there is how that traces through my code. What calls what? What can I um, see? Now, what we would have done before is this is a little code block of, um, of open telemetry. Um, so the magic here is I've got two different, um, two different packages that I've added. We've added our um, open telemetry distro. Um, and we've added this new thing that I've been working on, which is about code attributes, which we'll come on to. Now, all this is about how do we get better than these logs? How do we get something that's going to show us a little bit of causality um, and provide benefit to our core analysis loop? So what we've done, we've added open telemetry. Um, we've added in our ASP.NET core. I've added in the um, entity framework stuff, and I've added in Honeycomb. Um, now, the other magic is something called enable local visualizations. Um, which is our new setting that we're adding to try and bring that development experience and level up that development experience while using Tracy. So what does that look like? If I cancel that and run it again, what I'm now going to get, um, if I switch back to here, let's just refresh the page. Um, and we'll refresh it again. So what we're now going to get is a link in our um, in our thing here. So there's a trace for students, which is our controller, um, and we've got a trace directly into Honeycomb. I can click on that, and I've now got immediately that causality of what's happened. I've got my students call. You can see how long that was taking. You can see how long the database was there. I've got my database query right there. Um, and what I've also got is I've added my own custom spam, and this is manual instrumentation. This is I know there's something important in my code that I want to be able to see. Um, and what I've, been, what I've done there is we've actually got a link directly into GitHub. So I can take that and I can go straight into the GitHub repo, straight to the line of code that generated that span, but not just the line of code, the line of code in that particular revision. So if you can imagine in a production scenario, not only have we got these um, things that we've been doing locally, we've also got them in production as well. So you can actually get straight from that production code all the way through. Now, the other thing that we've added in there as well is um, when you're running locally, obviously you want to be able to say, um, we've got a VS code link. So I can take that link, um, copy that out, go straight back into my VS code, dump that in the top there. And that'll take me again, straight to that piece of code that generated that individual spam. And you can see I've added in there that number of students as a count that came back. So I've now got some rich information in my code about what exactly is happening. And I don't need to attach my debugger, which means that I can actually run a site a lot more um, locally, a lot better than I could before, because I don't have to hit individual API calls and hope that they all work together. I can actually just, if this was a React app and there were seven different ones of these, you'd see in the bottom here, every single one of those calls with that name of that route that's come in and you can click into each one of them and find out what happened in there. And if we can do that locally, what about when we get to production? Well, we've got exactly the same bits of information. We've got exactly that same debugging cycle. And that is what really, really excites me about tracing during development. This blows my mind because like I have spent way too long. Fortunately at Honeycomb, all of our internal instrumentation has pretty uh, unique span names. So it's usually possible to uh, search GitHub um, for the particular uh, span name that I'm seeing in, in, in a trace. But being able to jump directly to the line of code that generated it, like without having to search, that's amazing. Like, but it's not just that. In Dev and in Prod. It's the commit hash as well. So yes, you can go on there. You've got to know which commit was deployed. And obviously, if you're running decent oh, development shoot, cycles, right, then it GitHub should just be the main branch. Searches, yeah, GitHub only searches the main branch. And it's exactly. often like three hours delayed. Ah, yeah. So you can actually go to the previous commit that actually deployed that particular thing. And be, you're actually searching the bit of code that's actually in production at the time when you do it. And that's that idea of somebody in the development world where somebody sent you a bug and said, yeah, yeah, this bug's happened. And you go, all right, well, I don't know this, I don't know that. Well, I'll just hop into Honeycomb. Well, I can see the trace that's happened. I can see the actual line of code for the actual commit that actually generated that bit of code. Oh, it was that that bit of code hadn't been deployed yet. 
and that time to be able to debug that that particular issue that happened in production gets reduced down to minutes rather than days. Continuing to close the loop, right? Like rather than you having to go to GitHub and sort of correlate like which, you know, which commit was it, right? And do some of that cognitive overhead again, right? Anything that you can do to unify that experience and just make it cohesive in one place using the same workflow, right? Like that, that that's what we're trying to get to. So I, I love this work, Martin. I think this is brilliant. What I would say is this is just the start. This isn't the end. This isn't the thing that we're doing. This is just the start of that journey of how can we make that local development experience with tracing amazing in the same way as it is in production right now. So there's more to come. And that's why we had a very lengthy discussion about what to call the parameter. Um, I think that was what took all the time over the last two days, deciding what the parameter <laughs> name was. Um, but it's about being able to visualize all of these things locally. How can I bring this into local development? So there's lots more to come. So um, keep watching. Dude, so cool. <laughs> uh, let me reshare. Sorry, I was the one that was sharing slides. Cool. Um, so yeah, thanks for that. Like what I, what I would say about the book is, um, the way that things are structured, uh, actually in the chat, let me know if you had a chance to read the book or if this is new to you and we'll know how much to cover here, but the way that this book is structured, right? We sort of start with like observability concepts and definitions and like things that are required to get there. And then we look at what it means to use observability in your teams, right? And so when it comes to observability driven development, what we're doing is we're talking about like bringing development and operational concerns closer together, right? And so to Charity's point earlier, where, uh, you know, it, it seems like SRE and like platform and operations teams are really steep in observability. But when it comes to developers, right, we're a little bit earlier in that curve. I think, you know, you have to be operationally minded to think about those gaps between development and production and how you minimize those, right? And, and make it easier to understand what's happening in between the two. Right? And so that's where the practice of observability driven development, I can never say that like, in one <laughs> shot, uh, but that's where that really comes in, right? And so in the book, right, in, in covering operations for teams, right, that, that's where this sort of uh, workflow really comes in. Anybody have any questions or, or want to um, ask Barn anything before we move on? I'm, I'm trying to move slides and there we go. Sorry, Google, yeah, what are you gonna do? Feel free to just unmute yourself and ask since we have a small enough group here. So um, when, uh, when it comes to uh, practices on teams, right? We spend a little bit of time in the book also looking at uh, ways to get started, right? So far we've talked about the requirements for observability, uh, you know, what that experience is like, how it comes together, how you can use it in development. But now, how do you actually get started? Um, how do you start rolling this out uh, in your organization? So uh, I think actually we have a really great set of folks here uh, to do that. So uh, Liz, Martin, as our official developer advocates and Charity as, as our first uh, inaugural developer advocate, even though you didn't have the title. I think y'all spend a lot of time talking to customers, talking to folks that are just getting started uh, where where do you start digging into this? Like, how do you really start proliferating practices across your org? I mean, I think it starts with um, <laughs> trying to replicate the kind of like eyes wide open, mouth open, like just sort of whoa moments like like Martin just showed. Because the thing is that like people have this idea that it's so much harder to work this way. And it's not, it is so much easier to be able to work this way when you actually have the right data so that you can just jump to it. Um, and when you can just kind of like impress people and, and make them kind of stop and, and realize like how, how they're working in the dark ages and then your job is half done. <laughs> I think there's a there's a lot that we can learn from um, how we started out with TDD and testing and things like that with when we talk about doing the observability driven or tracing during development, whatever we want to call it these days. Um, but there's a lot that we can learn from those scenarios of how do we start? Well, start locally. Start with the testing that you're doing locally. Start with small components. Start with um, those things that you can do inside of your world. You don't necessarily have to go straight to a production environment with it. Obviously, there's 
there could be other barriers in there, but you can start locally. You can start small. You can start to show some value even locally so that you know whether you're going to get that production value. Kind of a thing of meat in the middle, right? Like that you can definitely um, ingest things like your application load balancer logs or your, um, uh, you know, Azure load balancer logs, right? Like those are things that you can ingest with at low cost. And then you can also start from the development environment and kind of start tracing just not, not even multiple services, right? Like it's not even tracing in the sense of distributor tracing. It is like, you know, just uh, kind of attaching spans to things that you care about. And then eventually, as you deploy that into production and link things up, then you'll get a more complete picture, but you don't have to do it all at once. Yeah, I think that's one of the the problems that I've seen quite a lot is people thinking that tracing is just for distributed systems. When actually your the application that you write if it's a monolith is a distributed system because it's not one function. Um, all of these functions are distributed things working together to achieve that that bigger goal. So your system is always a distributed system. So why aren't we then using that, that causality, that trace waterfall, that, um, that async code that you write to know how your code's interacting together? Yeah, Every system is distributed. around async, right? Like, I think that that is a thing that is growing in popularity, especially with the Node ecosystem making async stuff super easy, with the Go ecosystem making async stuff super easy. Um, Right, like you start to have these problems that debuggers really can't help you with, um, at, you know, because they distort the timing of what's happening when. So my first exposure to ODD um, was when I was developing a um, tool mm -hmm. to rolling restart um, our fleet of retrievers at Honeycomb, um, which is our indexing workers. Um, and those indexing and serialization workers um, needed to, at the time, uh, not have two of the same shard restart at the same time. And we also didn't want to roll like half the fleet at the whole time. We wanted to have some maximum concurrency as well as making sure that we weren't um, accidentally violating the safety constraint. And it turned out that it was much, much easier to visually verify that the concurrency requirement is being met, the safety requirement is being met by kind of dry running it and looking at the trace than it would have been to write a, a whole bunch of like, you know, very concurrency sensitive unit tests. There's a related question uh, in chat that I want to bring up uh, since, since we're sort of talking about it, which is uh, like, when would you still use a debugger and what are your thoughts on the use of a debugger evolving, you know, I guess in a world where uh, observability driven development is a thing? So I, I think in single threaded worlds, yeah, the, there is still an advantage to that because you, you're essentially bringing that REPL cycle even closer. Um, if you've got one thread and you know that there's only one thread running, there's no async happening. There is nothing that's happening in parallel. Potentially, um, I'd probably still use that. Um, Honestly, in my local development, I very rarely actually run an application. Um, I focus more on outside in testing. And if you couple outside in testing with TDD, with observability, you actually don't need to run your application. I was working with a client um, last year that the, the developers who came onto the team really hilariously said, well, you know, how do I run the application? And all the existing devs went, oh, yeah, we we haven't run the application in quite a while because what they do is they had full visibility of those, um, all of those outside in tests and all of that kind of stuff. So very rarely actually using a debugger to do that, just using those outputs from your telemetry day or observability data to verify those inputs and outputs and all of that kind of stuff. So I find little use for a debugger now. Um, I mean, I thought might have been necessity when I started with VS Code and .NET, the debugger wasn't exactly amazing. So you had to find other ways around it um, because I love VS Code. But um, but yeah, I very rarely use a debugger in general um, to run an application because I very rarely run an application. Yeah, I think the two cases I can, I can, I can think of relate to kind of uh, performance engineering and where your application is crashing or deadlocking, where you can't get the trace spans off, right? Um, so one example of this is we've been chasing a uh, Go runtime deadlock um, for, you know, we were chasing it for like two months um, and we ultimately had to wait for a process to hang and then go and attach a debugger and see where it was hung because like there's no way you're getting traces traces from that process. It's, it's, it's going to be dead. Uh, I love that. Uh, this, yeah. Martin, I was actually going to uh, uh, ask you about something else that was in the chat, 
which is a very timely blog post uh, that just happened to publish at the same time. You want to tell us a little bit about what's in it? Because it feels very relevant at this point. Yeah. So um, based on a chat that I was having with a, um, a couple of people on the Slack, um, somebody made the comment of nobody wants to spend time um, doing um, instrument in their code and no manager is going to let you spend time instrument in your code, which um, it, it really it really hit me um, that, well, why they don't stop you writing tests, do they? Um, because to me, they're one and the same thing. So um, the, the question came up about, well, what do I do when my manager won't let me um, spend time instrumenting code? Um, the ultimate answer came down to, do you ask them whether you can write tests? Um, and well, no. And that, that's why I think we can learn a lot from the TDD movement because you know, you didn't put an estimate, oh, well, you used to, way back. It's like, oh, well, it's going to take longer because I'm going to write tests. Um, it's going to take a little bit longer because I need to write some unit tests. I need to write some integration tests. Um, and we've got past that now. Blows my mind. Like, your manager won't let you add instrumentation. Like, seriously, if there's one thing you can do that's an investment in your future time and the time, did they not let you comment your code? Like, I mean, this is just, it's mind-blowing to me that this is not considered basic hygiene at this day and age. Exactly. But surely, think- if I just throw something together and, and merge it without tests or comments, it'll, it'll, it'll take me much less time to get it merged, right? Yeah. So fast. <laughs> and then you know, the ops team will just deal with it down the road. Ah. <laughs> I mean, if you don't have any observability, you don't know whether it's gone wrong, therefore it didn't go wrong, surely. You know you what, Mark? I hadn't considered that. That's a, that's <laughs> a big point. You make a, you make a kind of a point there. <laughs> I mean, it's the whole point of, you know, if nobody tests your code, you won't find any bugs. Um, you know, so it, it follows logic. I mean, it's not great logic, but it does follow logic. <laughs> so I want to I want to make a call back to something that's in the book, right? And I want to I, I want to also uh, touch on something that Charity said earlier. Or I think maybe Liz was saying, you know, it, it, we were writing this book over the course of many years, and a lot of I think our recommendations have changed or ways to go about certain things like instrumentation, as we're noting. Right there, there are certain tactics that you can use in the book. I think what we have in terms of getting started are a lot of uh, sort of, a, 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 I guess, a, things that work universally for like a number of uh, solutions that you might adopt. When it comes specifically to instrumentation, one of the things that we recommend is uh, starting iteratively, right? Meaning that anytime that uh, you have an incident or you figure out something that you know could have been better like retroactively, you'll go back and add some instrumentation. And it's a little akin to the way that some folks started with uh, test-driven development as well, right? If we sort of make connections there, like there was a, a certain regression that occurred. So you would create a test to look for that thing, right? And that that could be a way to start with instrumentation as well. What do you make of that advice today? Is that still something that you would recommend or would you say something different? Yeah, that and also just like as a as a means of debugging, I think that we, we used to do that with tests too. Like, you know, got it, got it, got a thing you can't figure out. We'll just start adding tests. Like, if you don't have a really nice tight REPL loop with production, that's a good way to like rule out a bunch of stuff really quickly. And I think of that a lot whenever, whenever I'm telling people how to roll out, you know, instrumentation within their org. It's like, if something's working great, like, don't start there. <laughs> It's working, but whenever you need to understand something, like I think of it like a headlamp that you put on, where it's just like you know you instrument in, in front of your feet as you're going, so that you can you can make sure that what you're looking at is doing what you actually know, you, what you actually think that it's doing, um, which wasn't exactly an answer, but I was just going to say it anyway. So like maybe Martin can answer the question now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, yeah, <laughs> I can't I can't advance on what you've said. <laughs> Well, I think I think one of the things that I just wanted to point out here is that um, uh, one of the one of the tips that we have in the book is to start uh, your instrumentation and observability efforts uh, where your biggest pain points are, right? And I think that that's sort of what we're talking about, right? Just making sure that you use instrumentation in places where you can get some points on the board, where you know if you are encountering resistance to uh, being able to make time to instrument your application, you can actually see a return on what it is you're getting out of doing that. And I think the only thing that I really want to point out about uh, the advice that is in the book is, um, I remember when I first started working on this book, this was one of the earlier chapters that we had written. And I think all of the advice there for getting started is very relevant and applicable today. 
But I think there are a number of things that we have learned since. And so I just want to take a moment uh, to, to maybe be a little self-serving here and plug the fact that we do observability office hours. Uh, Liz, Martin, uh, Jessitron, I believe, like, are all part of that rotation. And so uh, I would highly recommend going out and checking out the content in the chapter for some basic ways of getting started. And if you start encountering roadblocks or other things that uh, may be getting in your way, I would leverage those office hours, talk, talk to these folks, get an idea of like what you can do today or, or how we would, uh, uh, I guess, uh, update some of those recommendations. Yeah. Anything else that you want to touch on in terms of getting started and some of the ways that you can get observability rolling uh, as a practice on your teams? I think there's a, there's a lot about socialization. There's a lot about blazing the way, not trying to um, think about this as a large scale implementation that I need to um, talk to the entire organization about and get them on board with what we're doing. You can start small. You can start in your own local development cycle. You don't need to think about this as a big, wide um, thing that you need to build. You can start just by like what we showed there, using it in your local debugging cycle. You can start um, in just one of your services. Like I say, I mean, it might be, not be the, the most um, painful service that you've got right now, but you can start by the services that you control, that what's in your remit, it will still provide value on a single service. It doesn't need to include your entire organization. And that's, I think, a lot of people get hung up with the fact that, well, why would I try and implement this when I need to get 17 teams to all use the same libraries, to all use the same things? Well, yeah, if you're using a standardized um, approach like Open Telemetry, then those things will come. They will start doing them at some point. But that doesn't have to be today. You yeah. can still get value by doing one service, that one service that you and your team control, that you control the CI CD pipeline, you control production for that thing. Just add it to that thing and don't feel scared that, well, somebody else will come along and we'll have to use a different tool. That's what open telemetry is for because you can do it. And whatever tool they decide to use off the back of it, that your tool will be compatible with it because you're using that standards. Yeah. <clears throat> That's a really great point. Thanks, Brian. I just want to point out in the chat, uh, in case you missed it, uh, Liz dropped the link to uh, uh, the office hours that I was mentioning, honeycomb.io slash meet slash devrel. And I believe uh, Bethany also dropped the link uh, to let you know about the survey. So you can let us know what you thought about today's session. Uh, there is a, uh, a password to fill out the, um, the survey uh, specific to this event. So this is apparently event five in the series uh, and that's event space five. So fill out the survey, let us know what you thought and uh, we'll send you a t-shirt. Thanks for coming everybody. This was super fun as always. And thank you for inviting me. <laughs> really cool uh, demo, Martin. Yeah, that was awesome. Absolutely love it. And so join us in Pollinators. Uh, we'll continue the discussion there in the book club channel if you're interested. And with that, we will see you next time, folks.